announce our next guest is considered to be on the fast track to become the first black speaker of the House, Congressman Hakeem Jeffries. He was selected as chairman of the House Democratic Caucus after the Democrats took control last November. That's fifth in line behind Nancy Pelosi. Mm -hmm, but the Democratic leadership is looking to come off young and hip. 48-year-old congressman is in a very powerful position, and Congressman Hakeem Jeffries joining us this morning. Congressman, thanks for being with us. Good morning. You consider yourself young and hip? Well, at least my mother does. <laughs> That's good. But in line for the speaker, it's too early for you to think about that, but you would be the first African-American speaker of the House. Certainly, but we have a lot of work to do right now, and so it's just a delight to be part of such a tremendous team led by Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who is doing a phenomenal job, and we're going to continue to try to conduct ourselves uh, where we articulate an affirmative, forward-looking agenda for the people focused on lowering health care costs and a real infrastructure plan and cleaning up corruption in Washington and bringing our democracy to life. I know you've talked a lot, I'm looking at your Twitter, about, um, well, white supremacy on the rise. How did, what, what are the numbers? What, what do you feel? Yeah, well, it's very troubling that uh, white supremacy is on the rise, both in this nation uh, as well as across the world, as most recently manifesting itself with the tragedy in New Zealand. The Anti-Defamation League last week just came out with some statistics showing that uh, white supremacist propaganda has increased dramatically over the last year or two. And I think we all collectively have a responsibility to make sure in the great United States of America uh, that we come together, that we don't continue to tear each other apart. And would you also put anti-Semitism on the rise on that list? Absolutely. Anti-Semitism is clearly on the rise. Okay. I've spoken to this uh, in Washington and at home, including most recently when I was in South Brooklyn, and we need to do everything possible to stamp it out, both anti-Semitic incidents, uh, which are on the rise, and we've seen some troubling examples here in New York City, most recently anti-Semitic uh, graffiti connected to Ruth Bader Ginsburg at a subway station in Greenpoint. That's disgraceful, uh, and we need to do all that we can to stamp it out. To your point, though, the president just said recently that he really doesn't see any rise in white nationalism, that it's just isolated with a few people here and there. You think his language needs to be stronger? His language absolutely needs to be stronger, and it's unfortunate that the president of the United States, the leader of the free world, continues to bury his head in the sand. And I don't know uh, why he's doing it, but it's certainly... Uh, if you look at his own FBI uh, statistics, it indicates that incidents uh, relative to bias and hate crimes, anti-Semitism, the rise in white supremacy organizations are all on the rise. So Nancy Pelosi says that she is not interested in impeaching the President of the United States. Where do you stand on that? I agree that we need to proceed with caution. We need to focus on the substantive agenda that we've articulated to the American people. We didn't run, uh, Rosanna, as you know, on impeachment. We didn't win on impeachment. Uh, we shouldn't govern anchored in impeachment. I think what the speaker has done is articulate an appropriate, robust, strong standard, which is to say that if we were to even consider going down that road, the case should be compelling, the evidence should be overwhelming, and public sentiment toward impeachment should be bipartisan in nature. So it should go along the lines of once the Mueller report comes out, if it's fully given to the House and to the public, because ultimately, as you brought up, the public, the taxpayers paid for the investigation. That's right. I think we have to wait until the Mueller investigation is completed. And there are a whole host of other investigations, most prominently the Southern District of New York investigation has taken place right here in Manhattan that needs to be completed. And then the public needs to be provided with that information so we can all collectively decide how best to proceed. So you've been called Brooklyn's Barack Obama. <laughs> how do you feel about that? <laughs> but also, I mean, you are getting pressure from within your own party. Uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, is thinking about putting up a challenger against you uh, to unseat you. How does, is that unnerving? No, well, you know, America's a free country, democracy is a beautiful thing. I know, but she's within your party well, and a freshman. Yes, you know, she has publicly denied the reports and so who knows what's true, what's not true. All I can do is continue to be the best possible, <coughs> excuse me, representative for the people of the 8th Congressional District in Brooklyn and Queens that I'm privileged to represent, work as hard as I can, and then next year they'll be able to decide whether I get my two-year employment contract reauthorized. <laughs> but you know, as a Brooklynite, are you given to the side eye a little bit? Well, my response uh, <laughs> to the entire report was to quote 
one of the most famous uh, folks who came out of the district I represent, Notorious B.I.G., when I said, listen, spread <laughs> love, it's the Brooklyn way. <laughs> you do share a birthday with the, with the former president, I correct? absolutely do share a birthday with the former president. We were both born on August 4th. All right, let's talk about uh, the bill, the bipartisan bill that you have brought up with uh, prison reform. Tell, talk to us about that. Well, it was a great honor over the last two years to work closely with uh, Laurie, my friend, Congressman Doug Collins, uh, who's a conservative Republican from rural Georgia. Uh, I'm a progressive Democrat who represents what has sometimes been referred to as the People's Republic of Brooklyn. But we were <laughs> able to, you know, sort of collectively come together. Uh, recognizing that our mass incarceration epidemic in this country where we incarcerate more people than any other nation in the world, over 2.1 million people, uh, is not a Republican issue or a Democratic issue, it's an American issue. And overcriminalization was something that was important for us to address, both to help currently incarcerated individuals successfully get back into society reduce recidivism and save taxpayer dollars. And we also worked with the Trump administration to get this bill signed into so they, law. So the Trump administration has been working alongside? Absolutely. Uh, Jared Kushner took the lead over the last two years. President's we worked closely with him, the president's son-in-law and senior advisor. Uh, and on December 21st of last year, the First Step Act was signed into law. And it was widely viewed as the most significant piece of criminal justice reform that Congress has enacted in a generation. Wow. Let me ask you something. There was a, a time where you were thinking about running for mayor of New York City. Are you still thinking about it? No, I'm focused on the House of Representatives and uh, some folks throughout the city had raised the possibility of a mayoral race. Uh, but once the president was elected, uh, I concluded that I had a responsibility to be part of the team down in Washington all hands on deck to serve as a check and balance on what could be an out of control executive branch. The president also released his his budget. And there were, you know, much of it taken away from some of the social programs that I imagine you you support uh, all in the name of the wall as well. Yeah, and this was problematic in terms of a budget because the president himself on the campaign trail said he wasn't going to touch Social Security, he wasn't going to touch Medicare, he wasn't going to touch Medicaid. And then he drops a budget on the nation last Monday that would cut approximately $2 trillion over a 10-year period from Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. And we're trying to figure out what happened. This is not a good thing for the American people uh, in terms of us having a strong social safety net for working families and middle class folks. And the seniors that I run into in Brooklyn and Queens will tell me all the time, including Howard Beach and East New York, that Social Security and Medicare aren't entitlement programs. They've paid into those programs their entire life. They should get what they deserve. Do you think that the president is doing that just to get your attention so that he can get money to build the wall? And what can be done? Because whether you know you, you d describe it as a crisis or not a crisis, there are almost a million people who are trying to sneak into our country.